name is uh, Dr. Katja Lasch and I'm uh, the director of the German Center for Research Innovation and I'm glad to welcome our panel who will discuss uh, the pandemics and equity, but also to welcome uh, the participants uh, here for this uh, event, which we are really glad uh, uh, to host. The German Center for Research and Innovation is an organization of uh, 18 institutions who are present in India and uh, 18 German research institutions. It has been founded to connect the Indian and German world of research and innovation uh, in different fields, reaching from the applied research to fundamental research uh, and looking into different fields, the science and uh, the humanities. So we help to connect people, we bring people together and we discuss uh, topics of or relevant topics um, from different perspectives like the one uh, today. I have to say that the topic of pandemics and equity uh, has been borne out of the observation that there are multi-faceted connections between the pandemics and one can look at from different perspectives and the issues of justice or equity. So uh, we have all experienced and seen over the last uh, two years uh, what has happened and I'm really glad that we have a distinguished panel today to discuss uh, uh, interactively the topic. Uh, the moderation of today's uh, fireside chat is taken over by Professor Gulshan Sachteva, who is uh, at uh, who joins us from the Center for European Studies at the JNU in uh, Delhi. Uh, just would like to mention uh, in the discussions, uh, um, please feel free everybody to put your questions in the chat. And now I hand over to uh, Professor Sachteva, who will introduce the panel and uh, take us forwards into this fireside chat. So, uh, Professor Sachteva, if you would take over. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Katya Lash, and uh, I hope uh, Dr. Matthias uh, Kisselbeck would be also be able to join soon. And let me formally thank uh, the German Center for Research and Innovation, DWIH, and of course, uh, Dr. Katya Lash for inviting me uh, to moderate this uh, important panel on pandemic and equity. Uh, we have very distinguished panel consisting of uh, Dr. Johanna Henfeld and uh, uh, Professor K. Srinath Reddy. Both are well-known um, personalities in their uh, field. Uh, Dr. Johanna Henfeld, uh, she's head of uh, Center for International uh, Health Protection at the Robert Koch Institute, Germany. And uh, she's also a professor of Global Health uh, Policy at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicines. And uh, uh, her work is situated within the field of health policy and systems and uh, she focuses on political economy of global health. And her recent research is on uh, health systems including resilience and quality and on the impact of medical travel and migration. And Professor K. Srinath Reddy, of course, he doesn't need any introduction in India. He is the president of uh, Public Health Foundation of India. Um, and he is formerly, uh, he was head of the Department of Cardiology at the premier uh, medical institute in India, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And under his leadership, uh, the Public Health Foundation of India has established five Indian Institute of Public Health. Uh, basically to advance multidisciplinary public health education, research, health technologies and implementation of support for uh, strengthening health systems. Uh, he was also appointed as the first uh, Bernard Lawn visiting professor of cardiovascular health at the Harvard School of Public Health and presently also serves as adjunct professor of epidemiology at Harvard. He also holds very advisory positions in several national and international bodies and uh, he has over 500 scientific uh, publications. Uh, welcome uh, both of you to this panel. Uh, now we all know that you know in the last two years uh, the world has changed dramatically as a result of this pandemic. Uh, now the health and economic consequences of the pandemic are clearly evident throughout the world. As per the WHO, so far about 350 million infections and more than 5 million deaths have been officially recorded 
as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we also know that official figures in large number of countries may not fully reflect the true nature of the pandemic. In fact, the Economist has given various estimates of about 15 to 20 million deaths as a result of the pandemic so far. Now, just few, a few months back, you know, the many analysts were talking about post-pandemic world. But as we speak, uh, the pandemic is still unfolding. Uh, in a way, we are still in the middle of the pandemic. In the last few days, India has recorded about 300 cases a day. And similarly, Germany is also recording about 100,000 infections a day. But definitely, we are much better prepared today than two years ago. I'm not a scientist or a medical uh, practitioner, but uh, I understand by now we have sufficient knowledge about virus behavior. As WHO chief said today, uh, we are at the critical juncture. We must work together to bring the acute phase of this pandemic to an end. It's becoming clearer that the virus will be with us for a longer period of time. Uh, with the joint effort of the global community, I think the science has helped. Uh, we have a number of vaccines available now. Uh, to tackle the current phase of the pandemic, vaccination and vaccine equity are the key pillar of any strategy. Uh, today, nearly every nation is vaccinating. Close to 60% of global population is already fully vaccinated. And more than 95 country, countries have started uh, booster doses. But I think the figure is less than 10% in Africa. A few days back, I just read that in the poorest 50 countries, only about 6% people have been vaccinated. So vaccines are available, but the current mechanisms obviously do not lead to equitable distribution of vaccination. Uh, luckily, countries like China and India, they are able to produce large amount of vaccines. Uh, so they are able to vaccinate not just their own populations, but also supply them to many other developing countries. Now, vaccine inequity may lead to uneven economic recovery. And further economic divergence may lead to new geopolitical tensions. So there are various reports which suggest that in the last two years, more and more people have slipped into poverty, including in India. Uh, both globally and in India, what we have seen that the wealth of the richest layer has grown significantly in the last two years. At the same time, incomes of the rest of the populations have declined. Uh, so inequalities are growing and concentration of wealth is happening at the top. It's not that this has happened only as a result of the pandemic, uh, but pandemic has certainly accelerated this trend. Uh, COVID-19 has, I think, magnified existing social, economic and health inequalities. And everyone is at the risk for COVID-19, but uh, all have not suffered equally. Poorest have been hit hard, particularly the urban poor. Women have also been suffered disproportionately in many countries. Uh, there is also rapid digitization of societies. It has resolved some of the problems, but it has created many more problems, particularly for the vulnerable population. Uh, in India and in many parts of the world, education institutions are practically closed for the last two years. Informal labor markets have been badly disrupted. In a country like India, where close to 80% people actually work in the informal sector. So they are really badly hit. Uh, we have still very limited idea about how many people have lost jobs, how many children have dropped out from their education. Most of the surveys have not been possible in the last two years. Uh, you know, one reason also is that the major focus of the governments have been on tackling the immediate health crisis. Uh, the main concentration has been providing hospital beds, medical equipments, lab facilities, etc. I think there is also a question of equal access to health services. It is not just about affordability, 
but there's also prioritization by policy makers. So the overall, I think the sense is that the poor and the vulnerable have been affected disproportionately. Poor who have been, you know, have been living in the close quarters were the first to hit by the pandemic. And they were the first who lost their livelihood as a result of lockdowns. Now, all these developments are creating tensions uh, in the societies. Uh, these tensions will uh, will be manifested in various ways in the coming years. So there are challenges, there are health-related challenges, there are societal challenges, and there are also other policy-related challenges. Now, to discuss all these issues, uh, we have these two very distinguished guests from uh, Germany and from India. So may I first uh, invite uh, Dr. Johanna Henfield uh, from the Robert Koch Institute to make her uh, initial remarks. Uh, Dr. Johanna. Thank you to the German Center for Research and Innovation in New Delhi for um, convening us and, and bringing us together. And of course, Professor Reddy doesn't need an introduction anywhere in the world, especially because I'm also delighted that he was a visiting professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, my own Alma Atta. So it's a great honor to be here to share the, to share the panel with you today. Um, I wanted to introduce a little bit uh, the work of the Robert Koch Institute before I make some specific remarks on, on the equity. So the Robert Koch Institute is Germany's National Public Health Institute. Germany is small compared to India, so we have one National Public Health Institute, which is, uh, I think, considerably smaller in size than the um, uh, Public Health Foundation of India. Um, but one of the important developments over the last um, decade, I guess, has been the increasing realization that national public health uh, or the public health of a national population is inexplicably linked to global public health. So I, as a result of these processes, um, relatively recently in the last four years, the Robert Koch Institute also established a center focusing on global public health or on on international um, health protection. And that's the Center for International Health Protection that um, I currently lead. And where there is about um, 50 plus scientists working on um, a range of issues. So we have, a, um, we have a unit on epidemiological analysis. So we do some of the international epi analysis to inform the German government's activities. We have a unit on evidence-based public health where we review public health evidence as it emerges to provide um, actionable advice to policymakers. And we also have a large area of response. So we're engaging in international response mechanisms such as, as GONE or the emergency medical teams under the WHO. Um, uh, and we have a unit on preparedness and operations support. And then because we are the RKI, so we have a long history on laboratory as Robert Koch, uh, the 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 scientist whose name we carry was, was a microbiologist. Um, so we have a unit designated to providing laboratory support. And indeed, over the past two years, a lot of the activities have focused on that. So I wanted to share a bit what our work has been during the um, epidemic as an international, in terms of inter supporting international activities, um, rather than the focus on the national um, activities, which I think um, have probably been relatively similar in many countries uh, around the world where national public health institutes and the surveillance and, and the, the guidance to the public have obviously been of vital importance. So we have supported the national response in Germany through international analyses um, of the epidemiological situation as it unfolds, but also by looking carefully at the measures taken in different geographies and trying to learn from what from the measures under other countries have adopted. And then, and that's an important point for me, we have facilitated an exchange of expertise between bilaterally across many governments, but of technical experts. And I think that's really one of the collateral, if I thought about equity, one of the positive collaterals of the pandemic is really the large amount of partnership that has blossomed. And I think that's so vital to addressing the challenges that we are discussing today. As RKI, as the international part of the RKI, we've also supported outbreak response, as I mentioned, through some of the mechanisms, GORN as one, the EMT network. We've also had response missions and supported the establishment of, for example, um, molecular diagnostics in the West Balkans, a region that's close to Germany, where, 
where um, where they they have also that has also been heavily affected and so on. And we've undertaken a large number of trainings. So some of these have been online, but a lot has focused. Some has focused on the epi epidemiological aspects. A lot has focused on laboratory aspects, also IPC, so infection and prevention control. And again, much of this has been. Some of it has been in person, but a lot also in online. And we were delighted to to be able to also exchange with colleagues in Pune at the Institute of Virology on our experiences around sequencing. So actually, again, this is something where um, we didn't just provide, um, in a way, assistance, but very much had in great exchanges with Indian scientists that helped us in establishing our sequencing and organizing our sequencing and analysis around SARS-CoV-2. Um, but uh, but to also share uh, the lessons that we've had. And we've engaged in a range of research projects, really always with dual with a dual aim to strengthen capacity in the partner countries where we work, um, but also obviously to add to knowledge um, around COVID. And and I think one that brings me really to the to the point that we're discussing today. I think um, it's very obvious and, and very clear, and, and, and Professor Sajdiva, you've already um, spoken too much of that. Um, nobody can say that the vaccine rollout globally has been great or perfect or that anyone is happy with that. So there's obviously the great inequity around the, around the access to vaccines and the way in which this has been rolled out. However, at RKI, we focus on some we focus on some of the other aspects, so surveillance and laboratory. And I think you you mentioned also in your introduction that oh, the figures we we know these are the figures reported by the WHO, but we we know that there's an underreporting, and I think there's inequity in that underreporting around the world, and that speaks to me to one of the aspects which I think is sort of one of our core business is around surveillance, and I think one of the things that has that is inequitable, which is maybe not not talked about as much, is the one that we need a strengthened, um, integrated global surveillance system to be able to really understand um, understand where issues are and and where threats are emerging, but also to then be able to forecast and respond better in the future. So that's for me um, a key aspect. And another aspect, which I think again relates to, also relates to vaccines, but relates this pandemic has really highlighted in a very stark way is around the infodemic that has emerged or what is now captured by the term of infodemic. So the level of mistrust sometimes in vaccines, but generally around this virus, which is now um, sort of really recognized also by the WHO as a real threat in, in, addressing, uh, in addressing the pandemic globally um, and which is an issue everywhere. I think also feeds off inequality and the ideas around inequality. So I think that to me, those are some of the inequities which maybe are slightly less addressed, but which are just as important. And then um, I guess my last set of comments uh, that I wanted to make is, of course, around how the COVID pandemic has overall underlined the inequality and the inequities that we're facing. So in terms of who gets infected, um, of course, nothing is completely simple with COVID, but often it's the situations where people ha are facing marginalization. For example, housing conditions of, of migrant laborers at one point came very much into focus in different regions of the world, but as, as really areas where there was a lot of transmission. Then I think in what patients experience when they're in hospital, um, that is, and, and the healthcare that they are able to access, if they are able to access, relates to relates to their personal circumstances, and there's inequities there. And then, of course, and you again, Professor Sachdeva alluded to that, the the massive aspect of the impact, both that um, that the illness has on an individual or their family, but also that the measures that we have taken to address the spread of COVID has on people. So this has been very inequitable in many instances. So the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the lockdowns and so on, in many geographies have affected people in different ways. Um, and the reason why I say many is, is because I think there are examples, if you look carefully, and we've, we've undertaken some analysis um, where you could say, oh, if you, th if you think with an equity mindedness, um, you can actually counter some of these measures. So. Non-pharmaceutical interventions don't, by their nature, need to lead to further inequities. Um, so I think 
all of this uh, leads me to conclude on two points. I think because we've seen how the pandemic moves through waves, and when I say COVID is complicated, it's of course not that just the poor have gotten COVID, everyone has gotten COVID and, and the waves affect everyone. So, and I think that in a way is a, is a metaphor for inequality. Inequality is bad for everyone, right? Whether you're rich or poor, if you, if you have inequality, there are negative consequences to all. And the second point is that just like a pandemic, inequality is amenable to action. So it depends on the types of action, the types of policies that we implement, whether we can address some of these inequities uh, or whether indeed we, indeed we see them widening. So in building back better, if we say we are uh, moving through different phases of the pandemic, at least, I think it's important that we keep equity and the differential impact of COVID and of the social measures we adopt to control the pandemic in mind and actively work to counter them. So thank you very much. Those are my introductory remarks and I very much look forward to comments and questions. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Professor Joanna, uh, for your you know, introducing your work and also raising very important points. Uh, we'll come back to uh, discuss, you know, many of the issues which you have raised. Now, may I in, uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Shrinath Reddy, I mean, uh, with your own experience and everything. Now, time is, you know, it's we have only a few minutes for initial remarks, but, you know, uh, please uh, go ahead with your initial. Uh, I think I can't hear you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I will try and not repeat some of the very valuable points that you have made and Professor Hinfield has made. It's very clear that equity has been greatly challenged during this particular pandemic. Whether from the public health point of view, in terms of surveillance systems existing for timely recognition of outbreaks, of tracking and monitoring their spread, of identifying the emergence and spread of variants, the nature of surveillance systems that exist within countries are widely disparate, and there exists an initial inequality. Even when it comes to the question of establishing One Health surveillance systems, which connects the microbial migration from wildlife into veterinary populations and human life, there again, those surveillance systems are very differentially developed across countries. And there is therefore an important element, both in terms of recognition and control, which is faltering in the surveillance mechanism. Then we recognize that public health systems for recognition and response of outbreaks, for containment, for contact tracing, all of these essential vital public health functions are also inequitably distributed because health systems have been inequitably developed. But even within those health systems, public health has not always received the attention it requires. Then even in terms of clinical management facilities, we have seen there have been great gradients in the availability of clinical services and even within the clinical services, we have seen primary health care greatly neglected and are paying a price, particularly because of the neglect of urban primary care, where initially the pandemic ar arrived and started spreading. But even rural primary care has been an uh, area of neglect, and we have seen that too reflected in the course of this pandemic within this country itself. Then we have seen supply chain vulnerabilities that have greatly impeded the ability of countries to access vital equipment, as well as even important ingredients for vaccine development in India. So all of these are essential inequalities which have been accentuated and very clearly demonstrated during the pandemic. One of the lessons that comes out very clearly is that we need an efficient, equitable, and empathetic health system functioning well in the steady state even before a public health emergency, for us to be able to develop a strong and swift response to a public health emergency when it actually comes in. And if you have weak health systems in the beginning, then you're unlikely to really build up that kind of a response 
with the kind of rapidity and strength that is required. And that resilience is missing, particularly when you're deficient in the first place, even in terms of your health workforce, to build the slack or to expand to additional capacity becomes extremely difficult. In terms of the vaccines, we have seen very clearly there have been disparities in production, distribution, as well as delivery. The whole area of vaccine nationalism of booster doses being cornered while many countries are remaining undercovered has been very clearly stated. But even beyond the production dynamics or even the distribution dynamics, even the delivery area has been greatly neglected. If you look at what's happening in countries, in Burkina Faso, 27% of the people have received vaccines that have been delivered to them. 37% in Ghana, 26% in Somalia, only 1% in Burundi. And of the World Bank's entire global assistance for vaccines, only 14% of the assistance has been for vaccine delivery. So you're assuming that health systems are capable of competently delivering, even when you're delivering these vaccines late and almost near the expiry date. And in Nepal, for example, it was estimated by COVAX that three to three, $3.80 would be the cost of delivery of one single vaccine dose. Whereas it now in a country which has a great deal of geographical difficulties in terms of mountainous territory, the actual cost is $18 for two doses. So we are seeing inequities being ref reflected not only in the supply of vaccines, but also in the delivery of vaccines where the health systems have been underdeveloped. And even when we are looking at other elements, whether it is personal protection equipment, we see, again, there is a great impediment in terms of accessing. Now, the CDC in the United States comes up with a recommendation that everyone, that everyone must wear an N95 mask. Now, it's not difficult to provide every citizen, every person in this world an N95 mask if countries spend less on futile wars and armaments. But we do not see that happening, that how many people are likely to be putting up with a flimsy cloth mask because suitable masks are not available to most people in most countries. So there again is a reflection of inequalities in a pandemic situation where the rich and the poor will fare differently. And of course, you have already clearly referred how lockdowns, isolation and quarantine affect the poor adversely in any society. But also non-COVID health services have suffered greatly. And that is an element of, again, inequality. When you have a health system which is not able to respond adequately to a public health emergency, even other conditions beyond the actual COVID emergency suffer. And we have seen that happen quite a lot. And then, of course, there are inequalities imposed by unfair travel bans, like recently on the African countries, where totally without cause, travel bans were imposed and those countries suffered in consequence. And while the advent of digital health is to be greatly welcome and we should really look at how digital health can greatly advance the capacity of health systems to bridge the gaps in access and, and uh, affordability. There is also the danger of digital nationalism coming up again. You have referred to the digital divide within countries, but there will be digital divide even across countries if we do not prevent digital nationalism to come in. Therefore, I believe there are very many lessons that we must learn if we truly believe that no country is safe till every country is safe or no one is safe till everyone is safe. We must actually ensure social solidarity within countries and global solidarity across countries. It is not just the question of building back better to restore systems that were broken in the first place. We need to build forward better, broader and fairer. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor um, Reddy. I mean, you have raised, you know, in a very limited time, you have raised so many questions and uh, uh, so many issues you have touched, you know, from not just only the broken primary health systems in country like India and uh, uh, looking at not just uh, vaccines, the you know, on the production, but production distribution and particularly the issue of delivery. 
and also on um, you know non covid health services unfair travel bans and uh, particular the supply chain vulnerabilities and all the disruptions which has happened so large number issues are here uh, now may i just start asking both of you which is you know uh, which uh, which is the key and uh, everybody has spoken about it and everybody has recognized it about the vaccine inequity now you know professor reddy you have also yourself mentioned that you know uh, every, no one is safe till everyone is safe that's what everyone keeps saying but the fact of the matter is that uh, you know at once there are countries where you have third dose fourth dose all kind of things are happening and then we have not been able to send vaccines to many other countries and there are also many political economy issues because if say for example when india started uh, uh, you know sending vaccines to some other developing countries and suddenly when we were also hit by you know the second wave and this become a political issue so things are not just only about uh, recognizing it but also really how do you really implement in the global political economy and in the national politics how these things are played out so the question really is now where are we now can we uh, to what extent this vaccine inequity can be tackled now after all the two years of experience and what specific uh, uh, you know i mean steps can be taken individually and collectively and within that uh, another question related question to that also would be about uh, you know the temporary suspension of uh, property rights about uh, vaccines which india and south africa has been raising uh but uh, you know the the european union has not been very supportive of this idea of course they have listened to this but still americans have uh, fortunately supported but still we have to see how it has to be implemented now how do you really see this thing playing out at least in the next 6 to 8 months because still it's going to take time when everybody is vaccinated properly may I start with the professor reddy first and then i come back to dr johan well i think in the immediate future we ought to really ensure that we produce a much larger number of vaccines uh, for global distribution uh, while there are intellectual property right restrictions on mrna vaccines and even on the virus vector vaccines at least the subunit protein vaccines which can be produced in large quantities and relatively inexpensively with a lot of global experience already for other vaccines available with that particular platform we ought to be able to produce a huge amount and start supplying to the rest of the world so uh, that is the immediate early solution but the mid term and the long term solution is to build vaccine production capacity across the world in a distributed manner and not to have only few centers which are producing a, huge, a certain amount which can be coordinated by the rich countries so i think geographically in across asia africa latin america we need to have greater capacity for vaccine production increase and that is something that we ought to aim and aim to and of course as an intermediate term a solution we also look, look we should look at uh, uh, the india south africa proposal of uh, suspension of uh, intellectual property rights for all pandemic related products vaccines technologies and drugs because that is going to be an important element as well but i believe we ought to invest a lot more in a distributed global production capacity for vaccines um thank you uh, professor uh, johanna uh, would you particularly from the what would be the european perspective and specifically on the intellectual property rights and those issues i mean a temporary suspension of this yeah so it's hard for me to comment on that to be honest because the, there's a separate government agency in germany that deals with the vaccine issues so that that does not lie lie with us i think on the on the issue i, I there's a couple of points i would say is i would completely agree with the with the analysis of professor reddy so about the short term and the medium and and long term and i think i do think we have the multinational platforms now covax the act accelerator i think they can be strengthened and i think we need to massively scale up right so especially at the beginning this was a question of scarcity really not enough vaccines being there um i do think so this is much more where 
I sit in the where where the activities of 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 the RKI sit. I think all the issues around organizing a vaccine rollout and and distributing this in a public health manner and uh, sort of in a through a public health system. There are a lot of important questions about safeguarding, but also about delivery, about rolling out, um, and and so on. So the the NITACs, for example, these national immunization technical advisory groups. They are technical committees that look at that at, at national level and 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 they are very important so we've worked with them for example to strengthen them and i think those issues are important and they're important that's why i mentioned this infodemic because vaccine hesitancy obviously is an issue everywhere it's not the issue and i don't want to use it as an excuse but i just want to say that it's it's there are multiple aspects of the system that need to be addressed i think the second point, and, and just to really emphasize this, I think this has been underlined by the pandemic again, is that in the medium and long term, you need more decentralized uh, capacity for production. And again, I think there, if there is a window of opportunity to push this now, because there are now initiatives underway to do more regionalized um, production capacities and to really address this, uh, it seems to be at the crisis points that these windows of opportunities are there. And I would really hope that that it's possible to galvanize enough movement at, at this moment in time uh, in the world to the, to ensure that we actually move move forward with, with those initiatives. And there are some, obviously, so, so on the African continent, obviously, with the, with the regionalization and, um, uh, and so on, some of these initiatives. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, uh, Professor Johanna, you also mentioned in your uh, uh, earlier intervention about the underreporting and uh, that creating a different kind of uh, problems. So yeah, now with two years of experience uh, throughout the world about this pandemic, uh, do you think this is uh, really a serious problem for any kind of uh, planning to tackle this uh, pandemic? Or only trends are enough, perhaps, to you know, put things in certain perspective. We, I do not know really. I mean, you people know much better, uh, because obviously everybody knows that there is a huge underreporting, both about the number of infections and people are not even tested, and then all the deaths recorded later on or not recorded at all. So, how do you really? Uh, how important this particularly underreporting this issue is? I think, uh, Professor. Sorry, I think if I just jump in there, I think Professor Reddy said it right. It's not just about addressing this pandemic because now we have the different indicators from we understand the pathogen. So we know where the trend is going, but it's about preventing the next one or recognizing an outbreak early enough that you prevent the next epidemic or, or you prevent it spiraling into something. And I think there that, that uh, aspect is about, is around the sort of piece of the global surveillance uh, network where we need stronger stronger pathogen uh, a network for stronger pathogen genomics and greater greater networking in that area and strengthening of that surveillance. So I think thinking holistically um, beyond just where we are now, but again building something for the future, and that's where I think we we do need this system. Yeah. So then it means I understand correctly that it means at the moment, even if with the, some under report reporting, at least as far as this pandemic is concerned, it's not going to make major difference as far as the pol policy planning to tackle this issue is concerned. I mean, if I could follow you correctly. I, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to send the wrong message, right? So I think we need to continuously strengthen our surveillance system. That's important, even where we are now, to understand how it develops further. We're not at the end of something. We'll see. We may well see new variants emerge. So surveillance is important already for now. What I wanted to say is, is that really what what you want to think about, if you think about a greater integrated, for for example, greater capacity around the world to sequence and to understand new developments and, and the point that that Professor Reddy was alluding to was talking about the, the one health system, for example, where we can see things moving from from the animal sector into human health is that you want to also not just think about where we are now, but thinking about how can we avoid something like this in the future. That's not to say where we are now is perfect. We don't need to get better to control SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, okay. I, I would yeah. say that, uh, basically, as far as the case counts are concerned, particularly at this stage, it's going to be very difficult to get accurate case counts. 
for the simple reason that a large number of people are asymptomatically infected. So they are unlikely to get tested. And particularly that's going to be the case with Omicron. Therefore, you will never, and then even the diagnostic tests have false negatives. Again, you'll never be able to count all of them. So I, we will get some approximations to follow the trends, but it is the actual number of cases who get severely symptomatic and re require hospitalized care that we need to focus on and see how severe the epidemic is and whether it's declining or not. But nevertheless, we ought to improve our surveillance methods and case detection methods because if a new variant emerges or a new microbe emerges, we want to contain it early through early detection and contact tracing before it actually becomes a widespread pandemic. So we do need to invest in good surveillance methods. But right now, I think getting the accurate case numbers is going to be difficult and this doesn't really influence our strategy. Okay, uh, uh, you know, the next question uh, which comes to mind uh, basically about because there is the impression in the last two years now uh, that the multilateral institutions which were supposed to deal these kind of issues, global issues, somehow they haven't really performed well or uh, they had not been very, very effective. Of course, we do have... Uh, now, access to COVID-90 tools, ACTs, and, uh, you know, the COVAX has also delivered about 1 billion or so, if I'm not wrong, uh, vaccines. Uh, so, I mean, what was already in your assessment, uh, is this criticism is uh, valid or um, uh, there are really, I mean, uh, things could have been done in a different manner by multilateral institutions and they have let down the global population? Well, multilateral institutions like WHO have always had weaknesses, partly because they have been underfinanced globally, and therefore they have been dependent a lot on limited country funding, which is quite uh, sometimes vulnerable, like President Trump uh, decided to withdraw from WHO and fund, defund WHO. Uh, and uh, therefore they are quite often dependent on other donors as well. I think we ought to increase the funding to WHO and make it strong enough so that it becomes less dependent upon this kind of fluctuating funding. But more importantly, I think in terms of global agencies like COVAX, et cetera, which offered to provide a lot of vaccines and multilateral partnerships emerged, unless there was a very strong focus on procurement of vaccines uh, from the pharma industry, without necessarily letting the pharma industry provide only to the highest bidder. Uh, that is where the problems arose. COVAX couldn't get the vaccines uh, which were promised to it so that it couldn't even distribute them and distribute them in time. So we ought to work out relatively fail-proof arrangements for the future. And again here, being hostage to a few pharmaceutical industries is going to be problematic. I think we ought to have a well-distributed global capacity for vaccine production, of course, with quality assurance. Thank you. You know, uh, Dr. Johanna, she mentioned about, uh, you know, the measures which were uh, taken by different governments to contain initially the virus. And Professor Reddy, if you, uh, if you look at the Indian example, um, you know, initially uh, when it, uh, the, the vaccine, uh, I'm sorry, when the virus came to India, I mean, we had, you know, a couple of hundred cases at the moment. And still, I mean, even at that point of time when the whole country was locked down for months together. Now, with your own experience now and with two years of things which has happened in India, uh, I mean, for a person like me who does not understand much, uh, you know, uh, these things about uh, medical, how it has to be contained. And of course, we, we, I mean, it, it was new for many others as well. So what we have really done well in the last two years, at least particularly I'm looking at the Indian example, and where we have, we could have done much better than what we did actually. So is there certain lessons for us for future pandemics or even to deal with the current uh, existing pandemic, personally? Well, I think the initial lockdown, whether it could have been handled differently is an open question for debate. Uh, but I think the government decided at that time that uh, they would like to prepare the systems uh, for a stronger response 
and therefore needed time to prepare whether it's a personal protection equipment or uh, medicines or hospital systems and uh, therefore the idea of trying to contain it when the cases were still on the lower side uh, that must have been the philosophy but i think what we did reasonably well was in ensuring that there was in the first phase at least a well coordinated national response with good center and state coordination uh, and while in the second phase i think we did not anticipate and incorrectly assumed that there would be no second wave and therefore our systems were not ready for the second wave which came up with a fairly devastating effect because of the delta and there again our weaknesses in the health system showed up but I believe later on we started recognizing that we needed to invest more in uh, increasing our capacity both at the level of clinical care and also to some extent in terms of vaccine production and public health services. Uh, our uh, ability therefore for domestic production went up and I think that is one thing that we can say we have done fairly well. Uh, even in terms of our genomic analysis and identification of variants, the Delta was identified for the first time in India, for example, and some other variants also were identified fairly quickly. So building up some of our scientific capacity and particularly for vaccine production on several vaccine platforms, I think that was a fairly commendable achievement. Uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that we actually also developed a capacity for production of the vaccines with multiple companies able to provide not only the domestically developed vaccines but globally developed vaccines also a production uh, engine within india uh, so that you can produce a large number of vaccines for global distribution i think that again was a plus point where i believe we did not do very well was in actually ensuring that we had a well-developed primary healthcare response because initially there are so many functions that you need to do on a symptom-based syndromic surveillance of households, early testing, contact tracing, uh, home care, rather than letting people rush to hospitals when they don't need to be hospitalized. Some of these elements were not handled very well in the initial stages. And right now, I think the preparations are a little better on, in that uh, context. Health information systems, data systems, again, we did not do as well in terms of getting the right case counts or the right death counts. And that is where, again, our information systems not only need to be improved, but different elements of our information systems need to be tied together. Uh, the vaccine registration system, the vaccine, uh, people who have been vaccinated, who have been infected, who have been hospitalized, all of these are different data bases. These databases must speak to each other if you have to get a coherent understanding of the pandemic. So some of these elements need to be rectified now. Thank you. Uh, uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. I'll just read and then uh, you can just pick up. Uh, now, the issue of vaccine equity and health equity in general should also include social determinants of health and also health seeking behavior of large population. Uh, and the second question is COVID-19 pandemic created the learning loss to children, loss of income, etc. at mass scale. So what should be strategy to plan for how to cope up to improve this loss? Dr. Ira Upadhyay, she has asked this question. And uh, yeah, there are a question of yeah these. Yeah, there's also another question maybe uh, to Professor Reddy in the Indian context. It's challenging to address state-centric uh, public health crisis through a top-down approach due to various state-specific needs. A, a dedicated technical advisory body at the state level which can periodically advise or give recommendations to state governments and directly issue instructions for implementation could be an essential uh, um, step for future endemics. It's from Shobha Kumari. Uh, so, uh, so these are some of the questions which have come uh, through the chat box. So, and if you uh, maybe uh, Dr. Johanna, if you can just uh, if you have to reflect any one of them or 
I would like to say anything about these uh, some of the points which have been raised. I'll reflect. I reflect very briefly. I can obviously not comment on the on the Indian context in any great with any great knowledge. I think the one thing to say is is that I don't think any one government got it right across all different waves, right? So we were learning about all aspects of it. So I think that's really important. In uh, we were learning about the virus and the virus changed. So we were learning across all different waves from this. And I think in part, when we look back, one of the things that we'll need to look at um, for the future again is, is how we can get this learning right. So how we can set up the mechanisms to get learning, to get the insights from science, which is constantly changing into our policy advice while taking the public along with us, right? While not creating distrust and so on. So I think, uh, for example, around the education, I mean, that's a very contest of, of what, around children's education, how to to address the inequities that have been created. That's one of the big big challenges. And at least I think at this moment, nobody's got quite the right answer for that. So in, in Germany, for example, we have very, very high rates of infection going on in, in our Omicron wave, where we are at the moment, we're still going up. Um, and it's, it's predominantly in the schools and based on the experiences we've had from the previous waves is we're trying to keep the schools open because we've decided that that is 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 better and then have got very specific measures to try and keep these safe but again they they vary across our states so our states are much smaller but still we've got a patchwork there with no one geography picking exactly the same measures so just to say this is always going to be a bit context dependent and also reflecting the values and politics um of that of a specific society or or, or a group so maybe that much from my side Okay. Uh, and Professor Reddy, just one, I'll just add one more thing you raised about uh, N95 that, you know, if you look across, you know, uh, the moment you go to any market anywhere, almost 80-90% people are wearing uh, cloth masks and, um, and everybody knows that they are not really very, very effective. And since and after two years, we have that capacity to produce N95 masks. And uh, and I'm sure the the governments also have that at least that resources that they can provide at least N95 masks to you know the population at least free of cost or at a very low cost. Why do you think it hasn't really um, kind of uh, captured the imagination of policymakers? I mean, this is a very basic thing, providing effective you know low cost masks to population because that's the way uh, everybody knows that 80 90 percent kind of cases can be really kind of stopped with this. Why it has really happened, if you can just add, uh, reflect, uh, kind of put a light on that as well. No, I entirely agree with you that if uh, actually governments can distribute, particularly at least, if not to everybody, to the low income groups, the families, uh, proper masks, and then uh, use that opportunity also to uh, inform them and educate them about why masks are important and how protective they can be for themselves and for others, I'm sure there would be a much greater impact on uh, transmission rates. Uh, I'm surprised that politicians have not utilized it. Uh, it it's an easy, inexpensive way to win popularity. Governments should do it as a matter of duty and probably political parties can do it as a matter of expediency, but either way it should be done. But uh, in terms of the other questions, very briefly, social determinants of health are absolutely critical they determine the health seeking behavior and the ability to access and afford health services. And we ought to really decide on how best to improve the social determinants of health in all respects. Uh, but particularly in a pandemic situation, we must try and ensure that the barriers are removed. Uh, in terms of uh, state roles, I believe entirely that uh, states, because that's where ultimately a lot of action will lie, will have to develop the capacity the planning overall uh, policy, overall policy can be at the central level with, in consultation with the states. Planning has to be done at the state capital level, but decentralized flexible delivery has to be done at the district level. And unless we do that level of decentralization, we'll never be able to effectively deliver our services according to the local context. Then lastly, in terms of education, I firmly believe that we ought to really open the schools and operate them. And if everybody does wear masks, and preferably if we can operate some of the schools, at least in reasonably well-ventilated places, we'll be able to limit the danger to children. But not allowing them to get educated in a proper school environment with socialization, 
with other children is going to be extremely damaging and counterproductive. Uh, there is another question. I mean, we have limited time, but if you could just answer, this is uh, 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 with the learning from the pandemic, will India see improvement in the public health system? Is government working on long-term policy to address this gap in the public health system? Now, this is the key question. I mean, whether, because if the question is really, I mean, as you have rightly mentioned, if the primary health systems are working, then of course you would have situation a very different situation. But will the you know with this pandemic will make any difference, or once things are reasonably okay, things will go back to normal? Uh, your reviews and just one more uh, thing, if you can add, uh, in your uh, initial remarks, you also mentioned about digital nationalism. Could just explain a little bit to you know our participants what exactly do you mean by that and how this is going to affect. Well, in terms of digital nationalism, I meant that there can be algorithms that are developed for different diagnosis and management, and if they are going to be also patented and are going to be priced, then that can be a problem. Secondly, even in terms of information sharing, if you're going to have very dis disparate uh, reporting systems across the world and from which countries decide that these are the best reporting systems and others cannot really report accordingly, then you cannot have adequate exchange of information as well. And therefore, it is the question of relative uniformity as well as ease of access uh, to digital technologies and digital information systems that I'm talking about. Uh, in terms of uh, the other uh, element that you did uh, speak about uh, just now, uh, which is on, um, I'm sorry, no. can you just... Yeah, no, with the learning from this pandemic, yeah, okay. it's improvement. The, the, public health, the public health will really get a boost. Yeah. Yes. I hope so too, uh, that health systems overall and public health in particular will get a much stronger boost because of the simple reason that the society has recognized that there are multiple disastrous consequences for the economy and for the social life if we neglect public health. Previously, public health emergencies came and subsided within a matter of a couple of weeks, whether it's a NEPA or a, uh, encephalitis uh, hitting the headlines. Uh, somewhere, uh, but within two weeks, the attention went away, or even less than two weeks, the attention went away. Now, for two years, people have recognized that not only health has been affected, but economic life, social life, all of these have been very severely disrupted. And there is wide recognition across people in different walks of life, uh, including the industry, the policymakers, and the media, that the economy will keep slipping on the banana skins of public health failure if we do not invest in strong health systems and particularly in public health. Uh, thank you both, uh, uh, Professor Reddy and uh, Professor Johanna. Uh, I think we have kind of finished our time, but you know, I think within a limited time, I'm glad that we were able to touch large number of issues. And I'm sure that, you know, our uh, you know participants would have been able to um, you know gain from uh, whatever we discussed definitely you know i was i i gained quite a lot actually with that you know even it was a limited conversation we had but you know uh, one or two things which was really uh, heartening for me uh, listening from professor reddy that you know this is uh, now there's a time, you know, particularly since I belong to the education sector and our universities are closed for the last two years. And I firmly believed, you know, for the last many, many months like you, uh, that, you know, we can easily open um, uh, selectively many of those education institutions. You now, why? Because, you know, the schools and colleges were the first to kind of shut down and they're still they have not been opened yet. In some of the states they have done it, but not really the higher education system is totally in disarray. And uh, particularly in a campus like, you know, our, you know, Joel and Harry University, I think we can have all of our classes outside. So, you know, it's, we don't have any space, I mean, space problem of any kind. And with, the, um, you know, uh, providing, you know, very simple things, you know, like, you know, if you provide all the students, you know, free kind of masks and everything, I think things can be easily handled uh, rather than, you know, looking at very sophisticated kind of things. Uh, I am, you know, with a person like you, I mean, I think uh, we can, uh, um, you know, echo these kind of ideas. Hopefully, you know, a policymaker will be able to listen. And, you know, because what we have seen that 
yes notionally everything is on but we know how you know for the last two years i haven't even seen the student those who have really got admission into the our programs and even if you know you know i don't know what's going on through the online classes that everybody ritual is there but uh, you know things are really bad as far as the education system is concerned i hope the time has come to recognize this and then with kind of suggestions which you are giving hopefully we'll be able to you know move forward but you know uh, the hope what we i can get from uh, this conversation is that uh, at least uh, you know uh, many of the things which uh, in the countries have learned they have also despite all the problems i think still countries have been able to work together and they have produced uh, you know of course i mean you know we can never be satisfied and there could be always be problems i mean but i'm sure uh, all the vaccine inequity and other issues once people are uh, you know kind of relatively assured that they have been able to vaccinate their own populations and i think even the market force is also to some extent will work and hopefully i think we'll be able to build our future health systems much better than what we inherited 2 years ago uh, now uh, thank you very much professor reddy and professor johana uh, for participating and over to uh, dr kartalash thank you so much for this interesting discussion i think we tackled a lot of um, problems also thank you professor sachdeva for highlighting the importance of education i think we all feel this uh, who are active in the field so thanks uh professor reddy thanks uh, dr johanna hanefeld and uh, dr sachdeva for this wonderful dis discussion which as uh, is a kind of uh, yeah also final point for our discussion on societies in transition we had it as a focus topic so we are glad that we could address uh, in today's discussion a lot of issues also the policy side and uh, the ongoing discussion so thanks again for the valuable inputs for the discussions and thanks also to our participants for their valuable questions they put into the chat i wish you all a uh, yeah nice rest of the day or evening here in uh, in delhi in india and hope to see you on one of the uh, dvh events we have upcoming uh, an indo german research day at the 24th of uh, uh, february where we will discuss open access science communication which is also part of this discussion here science literacy uh, but also um funding opportunities uh, for cooperation as we have seen in today's discussion that uh, international cooperation as it has been discussed is crucial and we should extend our and strengthen our international network so thanks again